And if you got an outline, great, you can follow along uh, as we kind of will fill in the blanks. If not, you can act like you're taking notes or whatever you need to do. But uh, we're glad that you're here uh, tonight. Jeremiah 31. And when you find Jeremiah 31 and verse 31, if you're physically able, if you'll stand with me and we'll read just a few verses here of Scripture as we dive right in tonight. Looking at the remaining portion of those major prophets, Jeremiah through Daniel. So, Jeremiah 31, look at verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. All right, so time out, new covenant. And the, the words New Testament are really interchangeable. They're, they're really the same, same thing, new covenant or new testament. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband to them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Let's pray. Lord, again, we've prayed several times. We've just finished a time of prayer, but we do want your help. So please help us to understand. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. So in all of these prophets, all of these major prophets, as we've gone through them, beginning at Isaiah, which we were in last week, and then going all the way through Daniel, there are references in every one of these books to a gospel message. It's not necessarily the uh, specific example of the cross and the blood that was shed on, on the cross, but there's a reference to or, or a, a, a message given about a coming Messiah, a coming Savior, and it's pointing us to that, that coming Savior in, in every one of these books. And we see the example here in Jeremiah 31, beginning in verse number 31 through verse number 34. Now, specifically, this is talking about Judah and Israel and the reunification that will happen when God rules with a rod of iron, so to speak, when he, he becomes the ruler and the reigner of this, this earth. Now, uh, in fact, as I was kind of reminding myself about the lesson and going through it again uh, just before service, Brother Tyler had asked me about a question about out of the Scripture, uh, right from the book of Revelation. And so, who are we talking about here, Brother Tyler? Talking about Israel? Yeah. We're talking about Israel. He, his question was about Revelation 7 and the saints, those 144,000 who will be saved because God working in their hearts. Well, we're talking about references between Jeremiah 31 and Revelation chapter number 7. So there you go. We're talking about from every tribe of Israel, people coming and God doing the work that only God could do in their hearts. Because they earned it? No, because he's, he's good and gracious to them. Because He loves them. Because they are still His chosen people on this earth. And that's why we would continue to, to say and to pound and to talk about, as we treat Israel, so is really our, our blessing from the Lord. If, if we choose to go away from Israel, then we can mark it down. Just, just plan on it. We're in for dire times. And God's judgment is going to come upon them because He said, those that bless thee, I will bless. Those that curse thee, I will curse. And, and you can watch as nations down through the ages have decided to try to turn their fist toward Israel and, and uh, with the sword try to eliminate them. And even phraseology used today, try to push them into the sea. God has His hand of protection upon them. And He blesses those that will bless and, and care for and watch over with Israel. Now, because we're big and bad America and we are allies with Israel, is that what's saving them? Nope. <laughs> that's God's hand that's keeping them safe. That's God's hand that's watching over them. But it's good for us to be on their side. 
It's good for us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and the peace of Israel. And so we're, we're talking about those specifically in this book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter number 31. So during the very difficult times of Israel, in the history of Israel, God is continuing to try to point their hearts toward hope. You'll remember, and we'll get into this here in just a moment, the book of Jeremiah is written before they go into exile. And there's some portions we're going to look at that are written to them while they go into exile. And all along, God is telling them, this is coming, this is coming, this is coming. Plan on it. Understand this is why it's coming, but I'm not going to forget you. I'm not going to leave you there. After 70 years, you're going to come back into the land. And while you're there, I'm even going to take care of you there. And he's continually bringing his people, the mind of, and hearts of his people, back to him. Because he loves them. Because he cares for them. Because he has their best interest at heart. But Jeremiah isn't written just for them. Jeremiah has application for you and me in 2017 here today. It's written for every generation of people. By the way, I would say that's true of this entire book. This entire book is written for all generations, all societies of people. And it's amazing to me, that ought to be encouraging, because as I thought through that this afternoon, you understand that God is big enough and strong enough and wise enough to bring over hundreds of years, over 40 authors together to write this book together, and it's applicable to every society that, that has ever been on the face of the earth? That alone is a miracle. That God, it, it isn't, it crosses every socioeconomic boundary. There's no part of town where this book is not relevant. There, there's no slum that's poor enough that, that, that cannot understand what God is saying in this book. It's for anyone and everyone. And that, to me, again, is a miracle of this book and a miracle of our God. He's big enough to be able to do that. And so how dare we just throw this book into the front part of our car and not pick it up again until next Sunday? We ought to be reading this and studying this and making this book a part of our life. That's why the, the psalmist would say, and, and the, the book of Deuteronomy, Moses would write, hide this book in your heart because there's something special about this book. This book is different than any other book you're ever going to read. This book will change your life. It has the power to be able to do that. It cuts down to the, 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 the joints and the marrow. It sees your motives when no one else can see them. It knows why you do things. And so you read a passage of Scripture and it's like, man, I don't like that. I know, it stinks when you get convicted. No one likes that. And so you go out the door and you say with a smile on your face, boy, preacher, you sure stepped on our toes today. Yeah, I know, because I got mine mashed on in the, the week before doing the study. I know, it hurts. But that's what's so great about this book. It doesn't tell me how good and great I am. That I got a champion inside of me, it tells me you're a low-down sinner. And all your hope is, is that you have God's grace and mercy. And so you rest in that. And that's what he's trying to tell his people here in Jeremiah. And all throughout the, these, major, these major prophets that we've been going through, I, beginning again in Isaiah, going through Daniel, time after time after time after time, God is pointing his people, he's pointing us to himself. And it's just, it's amazing. So, let's jump in here with Jeremiah. And on your outline there, if you've got one, the theme of Jeremiah is enduring hope. Enduring hope. There it is judgment. Oh, there's no question about that. There's judgment all through the book of Jeremiah. But also, there's restoration. There, there's those, those themes there. And then looking forward to future events when God is going to work and move on Israel's behalf. So, turn back to chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. And we're going to learn just a little bit about Jeremiah. Jeremiah 1, look at verse number 1. Do you know that Jeremiah was the son of a priest? He's a preacher's kid. <laughs> He's a, a PK, so to speak. He's a priest's kid. Look at verse number 1 of Jeremiah 1. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. So he's the son of a priest, and, and verse 2, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king in Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. Now, most of us, 
would remember. If not, it's not a problem, obviously. But Josiah comes onto the throne. Anybody know how old? Eight years old. Can you imagine? Any eight-year-olds in here? Some of you act like eight years old, but you're not eight years old. <laughs> eight years old, can you imagine our president being eight years old? Now, no comments. <laughs> I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying, an eight-year-old boy ruling a nation. Can you imagine? So Jeremiah comes on the scene about 13 years into Josiah's reign. He's about 21. And what has happened in the land of Judah is, now Josiah is in the land of Judah, the southern two tribes, you remember? That's uh, Judah and Benjamin are the southern two tribes. So Jeremiah comes on the scene right about the time Ju uh, Josiah is 21. Now what's been happening is Josiah has uh, some good, wise counselors in his kingdom. Praise the Lord for that. And they begin to speak to him the word of God. And you remember, they, they read to him the word of the Lord, and he gets personal revival, uh, personal revival in his own heart. And so what he does is he commands that the word of God should be taken to every town and village and hamlet and wherever else and read to the people. And what do you think the word of God does when it's actually read and people begin to listen to it? Well, revival begins to spark. And so the nation is going through this time of revival. Well, Jeremiah comes on the scene again about 13 years into Josiah's reign. He comes at a, a difficult time, Josiah does, but again, he leads this revival in the nation. Well, during this time, there's this priest from the tribe of Benjamin who's raising his family not far from, from Jerusalem, and he has a son, and his name is Jeremiah, and he's used by God to write this book and also the next book that we're going to get to in just a moment, the book of Lamentations. All right? And as you read, um, look down at verse number 4, chapter 1, verse 4. Let's just read some of this. You, you get the picture that Jeremiah is like, he, it's like he's sitting in a service somewhere and the, the scroll, the, the testament is being read, the scripture is being read, and God begins to speak to Jeremiah's heart. Listen to what he says, verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Now, that's a tremendous verse, and we could have a whole series of messages on that one, especially in the day and time in which we live, right? But God says, Jeremiah, I saw you when you were in your mama's tummy. I knew exactly what you were going to do then. It's amazing how much God, man, he's just so wonderful. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, this is Jeremiah's response to what God has just said. <laughs> oh, Lord, God, behold, I cannot speak for I'm a child. I can't do what you're calling me to do. God, I think you messed up on this one. I'm too young. But the Lord said unto me, verse 7, Say not, I am a child. For thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces. For I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. That's the life verse of every preacher. Be not afraid of their faces. That's a joke. Verse 9. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down and to build and to plant. Do you see those, those themes there? We've got destruction. We've got reproof and rebuke there that Jeremiah is going to give. But he's also, look at the last two words, to build to plant. Hey, we're not just going to wipe them all out. We're going to plant some things in their heart. We're going to work to build up this nation, build up these people, because I have a bigger plan than just wipe them off the face of the earth because they don't agree with what I say. We're, we're going to help them and encourage them and strengthen them. That's God's heart for his people. And so Jeremiah argues again, verse 6, but God reassures him. He's able to, to empower uh, Jeremiah to, to the work that he's called him to do. And the span of Jeremiah's ministry is really kind of given to us in verses 2 and verse number 3. It, it says from Josiah to, in verse 3, to Zedekiah. Now, those are the last 40 years before Judah, the southern kingdom, goes into captivity into Babylon. So the last 40 years of Judah, here's Jeremiah. 
Here's him preaching and ministering and serving and trying to get people to listen to what God is trying to get to his people. And the message is, prepare the nation for captivity. Prepare the nation also for their promised return. And we've mentioned this, I know, a few times before. But remember, how did Daniel and Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, how did they hear about God's faithfulness? Because of men like Isaiah and Jeremiah, preaching, telling them God has a plan for us. We're going to go away into captivity. Don't fear. God's watching over us. God's got his hand on us. And he's going to bring us back out of the land. And so when all of them are, are, are being taken captive, and we get to Daniel, and we'll get there here in just a few minutes, we get to Daniel, and he's the only one, it seems like, that's taking a stand. Well, where did he get that courage to do that? Because of the preaching of Isaiah and Jeremiah. Because he had parents, grandparents. There's a small remnant in Jerusalem and in Judah who are doing the listening and the obeying to what God is telling them to do. And in just a little bit, you're going to see God tells them exactly what they're supposed to do. And again, he's giving them hope, trying to build them up rather than just tearing them down. So Daniel is encouraged He's learning not to take the king's meat. He's, he's not stopping praying to God when we get to Daniel. How does he have character in the land of Babylon and in the land of, of uh, 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 Syria when everyone else is, is going astray? Land of Persia, I should say. How does he do that? Because he's listening to God's word being proclaimed. Now, uh, turn your Bible, go a little bit right to chapter 29. Jeremiah 29. So, Jeremiah has portions where he's written to them before the exile, before they go into captivity. Chapter 29 is a letter that Jeremiah writes to those who have just recently been taken captive by Babylon and are now in captivity in Babylon. They, they've just recently got there. This is God's word through Jeremiah's pen, so to speak, to those people. Notice what he says, chapter number 29, verse number 1. Now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem unto the residue of the elders which were carried away captives, and to the priests, and to the prophets, and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. After that, Jeconiah the king and the queen and the eunuchs and the princes of Judah and Jerusalem and the carpenters and the smiths were departed from Jerusalem by the hand of Elsa, uh, Elasa, the, the, the son of Shaphan and Gemariah, uh, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah king of Judah sent unto Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon, saying, Those are all people that have gone. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, verse 4, The God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. Look at verse 5. Build ye houses, and dwell in them, and plant gardens, and eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives, and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husbands, that they may, be, uh, they may bear sons and daughters, that ye may be increased there, and not diminished. And look at verse 7. And seek the peace of the city, whither I have caused you to be carried away captives. Now wait a minute, time out. <laughs> We're talking about Babylon here. The, the, the wicked heathen that are the enemies of God, I'm supposed to pray for them and make peace with them and, and seek the peace of the city, that's what I'm supposed to do? Yeah. Notice last part of verse 7. For in the peace thereof, that's a Babylon, shall ye have peace. In other words, as they're carrying you away, don't fight them. Don't try to rebel against this. It's not them as much as it is me doing this. So as I'm doing this, then go in, settle in the land. You're not going to be there forever. But while you're there, the, the emphasis is, be a testimony. Be a witness to those people. As you seek the peace and prosperity of the city, 
What God tells them is, as you seek that for them, guess what? You're dwelling there. You're going to have it too. You're going to prosper. You're going to increase. Because there were some, quite honestly, that as Jeremiah is walking to and fro throughout the city of Jerusalem, they, they put him in jail for preaching what God is telling him to do. And they will not listen. And the reason why they will not listen is because they don't want to hear what Jeremiah is saying. Who wants to, th those people who are so proud of their nationality, proud of who they are as a people group, that's the Jew, proud of that they are God's chosen people, the problem became is that became their emphasis, is their national identity. And so what is God doing? He's taken away their national identity. He's taken away their land for a time. Because th this is a consequence for them turning away from God. You know what Israel was doing? They were having young children and sacrificing their young children to false idols. That's not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so God is saying, you have all this pride in saying that you're God's people, you don't act like it. And so I'm taking that away. I'm, I'm taking the land away that I, I've given to you. I'm taking away your place and your identity. And what you're going to go and do in Babylon is you're going to be subservient to them. But never fear. I'm not going to forget you. I'm going to bring you back. And I'm, I'm wanting to help you to learn the lesson. <laughs> But there were still people who were rebelling. And so Jeremiah, God uses Jeremiah to write this letter in chapter number 29. And so for, for Judah, think about it. For Judah, this, this captivity is punishment for them. It's a consequence of their sin. But for Babylon, the bringing in of the Jews for Babylon is God's message of hope to them. God loved them and he wanted Babylon to turn and repent and come to him. And what he is saying to Israel is, I want to use you in that place to be a witness to the heathen people that are there. And so go, take you wives, give your daughters as wives to them. Plant gardens, build houses. Be a part of the society where you are. Be a testimony there. Don't rebel and fight at every turn. All you're going to do is make it worse for yourself because I'm the one who's in control. I'm the one who's doing this. So listen to what I'm saying. It's like these Jews were, for lack of a better term, were missionaries sent by God into that heathen place to be a testimony for Him. Look at verse 8 of 20, chapter 29. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you, neither hearken to your dreams which ye cause to be dreamed, for they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, saith the Lord. Those are the ones who are stirring up trouble. Let's rebel, let's fight and do all that we can. And God's word was, no, settle in. Give in, let go, be a blessing to them in the time that you're there. And God says, as they pray for peace, as they work for peace and live for peace, there's a, as there's peace in Babylon, God is going to give them peace. And the message is God's never losing track of them. God never <laughs> says, oh, I forgot about them. He... he, he continually is watching out for them. The problem is, as they go into Babylon, many of them didn't listen to the instructions. And they continue to fight and rebel against God and do what He has told them not to do. And honestly, it's because, again, they, they didn't want to listen to what they were being told. They didn't want to hear that. Who wants to hear, when you're proud of your country, who you are, who wants to hear you're going to go into captivity? I certainly don't. Right? So I got a flag, you know. Come and take it, man. <laughs> I don't want to be under captivity. So you understand, that's why they're trying to rebel. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to listen to that. And yet all the time God is saying, just submit yourself. Just obey in what I'm telling you to do. And if you do, it'll be better for your life. Because they're more attached to themselves. God says, I'm going to remove that identity from you. Look at verse 10. For thus saith the Lord that 
after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you. And notice, and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. He's telling them exactly what's going to happen. Now, verse 11, uh, verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Now, that's a great verse. The problem is when people take that verse out of context and make God a genie, to say, well, see, nothing bad is ever going to happen to me because God's always watching out for me and has my a good or my expected end. But understand the context of how God is saying this verse. The context of that verse and God saying it is into the context of suffering and captivity. And while you're going through those things, God says, I know what I'm thinking toward you. I know what you're going through. And I will, by the way, Isaiah 43, I'm going to bring you through all of those things. You're going through this now because you made the choices and the decisions to go through it. But I'm telling you, I'm not going to forget you. I love you. I care about you. I'm going to bring you through. God is working for a better end for Israel in this situation. He's giving hope for that expected end in the nation of Israel. So now, can we apply that principle today? Yes. Yes. Does God know when I go through hard times? Yes. Yeah, does, does God know when the valleys of my life are that maybe no one else does and I put on a happy face because that's what I think I'm supposed to do, but does God know? You better believe that he does. And he loves me enough to say, son, daughter, I care for you. I will bring you through. You trust me. Don't go looking at everybody else for help. You come and you trust me. I'll deliver. I'll give strength. When my strength is weak, his strength comes, and my strength is made perfect in his strength. Man, that's much better. Look at verse um, 12. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me. And notice, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord. And I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord. And I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. Did God do that? Yep. Remember those books of Ezra and Nehemiah that we read? Yeah, he brought them back. Brought them back into the land, helped them to rebuild that temple. They rebuilt the wall around Jerusalem. Remember in like 56 days? Wow. Wow. It's amazing what God does when He does it and when we follow what it is He tells us to do. Again, the message here is judgment, yes, but hope, yes. Judgment and hope. So, here's the divisions in Jeremiah, and, and we'll go quick here. Chapters 1 through 45 is God's plan for Judah. Chapters 1 through 45 of Jeremiah is God's plan for Judah. Now, who's Judah? Southern two tribes, right? Judah and Benjamin. That's the king that's been carried away into captivity in Babylon. Now question, what's been going on in Israel, the northern ten tribes? I don't know, we don't listen to what you say anyway, you're just flapping your gums. No, they're in captivity already. Right? Remember, they've already been taken captive by Assyria. And in fact, they're pretty well not around a whole lot. But what happens then, the second part of this, chapters 46 through 52, God unveils His plan then for not just Judah, but for the whole nation, the nation of Israel. Right? What is He going to do to bring the entire nation back? This priest's child, Jeremiah, during a time of revival, was called by God into the ministry to preach a message of judgment and hope, but was not listened to by a majority but there's a believing remnant that did listen, that did pay attention, that did obey. And these, these, this remnant stood for God. They obeyed God. They, they did what God told them to do. And get this, they even were able to thrive in a secular environment. They were able to be salt and light. And in the case even of men like Daniel, hello, he lifted him up to a place of leadership in heathen nations. Can you imagine? Why? Because he, was, he followed what God told him to do. He was just obedient. So, now, let's move into Lamentations, and we'll cover this quick. It won't take 
five minutes. It won't even take us five minutes to do. Lamentations. Here's the theme. Mourning, then, sends destruction. Who wrote Lamentations? Jeremiah. So Lamentations is, now that, it, now that Judah has been taken captive, it's like the setting of, of Lamentations is, we're, we're kind of sitting beside Jeremiah, looking at the city of Jerusalem, and looking at all the destruction that's just taken place because Babylon has just ransacked the, the whole city. And we're seeing the perspective, what, what's happening here in the city? Look at what's happened. Look at Lamentations chapter number 1. Lamentations, the very next book. Lamentations chapter number 1. Here's Jeremiah's perspective. As he's looking around at all this destruction, how doth the city sit solitary? Notice, that was full of people. How has she become as a window? She that was great among the nations and princess among the provinces, how has she become tributary? She weepeth sore in the night, and her tears are on her cheeks. Among her lovers she hath none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They are become her enemies. And it's just, man, everywhere Jeremiah looks, there's destruction. And that's the name of the book is Lamentations. He's lamenting over this fact. But as you, you think about the truth of, of the, the passage of Scripture here, and you think about all that's gone on, it's not just Jeremiah that's lamenting over the city. In a deeper respect, it's God that's weeping over the city. He is giving His lament over Jerusalem and their disobedience to Him, their rebellion against Him. In fact, you know when you're going to see it again in the New Testament when Jesus sits over the city of Jerusalem and He weeps for the city and says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Oh, how I would have gathered you as a hen gathereth her chicks, but you would not. That's the heart of God in the book of Lamentations. He, he is, he's heartbroken about these people who will not come to Him. Now, here's the division, divisions of Lamentations. Chapter 1. Chapter 1 of Lamentations is a short book, but there's mourning over Jerusalem's destruction. Right? That's the entirety of chapter 1. We're, we're mourning over the destruction of the city. Chapter 2 is God's wrath upon sin. And chapter 2 is, um, if you want, if you mark in your Bible, on chapter 2, I just wrote the word why. Why this has taken place. Why the lament in chapter 1? Because of the sin that's mentioned in chapter number 2. Because of the, 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 the rebellion against God. Now, chapter 3 then is... I love Lamentations 3. <laughs> it's hope in God's faithfulness. Oh, thy compassions are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Well, that's taken right from Lamentations chapter number 3. Because God is reminding Jeremiah, I have a plan for you. Don't fear. It looks bad now. But uh, Sunday's coming, so to speak. Victory's coming. Now, chapter 4 is God's justice is fulfilled. This is review. Can I have God's love without God's justice? It's not a trick. No. No, I can't. I can't have God's perfect love without God's perfect justice. Right? But God gives grace that His justice is, is met in Christ so His love can be performed toward me. Praise the Lord for that. But God's justice is fulfilled in chapter 4. And then chapter 5 is Jeremiah's prayer then for restoration. Jeremiah prays, ask the Lord, Lord, would you help to rebuild what has been destroyed? Would you bring and, and renew once again this nation? Help us please to honor you rather than ourself. That's a wonderful, wonderful book. We're going to stop there. I hope it's a help as you... As we go through this, I hope these are helpful things that as you read your Bible, oh, okay, this is what's going on here. That's the goal of our study is not to get necessarily in depth, but just to give you an overview to show you exactly what, again, what God is doing, how He's getting His gospel message of a coming Messiah to every, every generation, every group. He's getting His message of hope, of, of judgment to come, but there's hope also in God's Messiah. There's hope in God's way if you'll just follow Him. Well, hello, that's the same for us today. There's hope for us. Praise the Lord. 
There's, there's hope for our neighbor who's lost. There's hope for our coworker who has a foul mouth. And it just, it's hard for us even to, to be around them. There's hope for them. Not in us, in Christ. <coughs> Praise the Lord. Grateful for it. Let's pray. Lord, thank you very much again for the day. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you for the message of hope that's found therein. And Lord, I pray that now as we uh, take our offering, that uh, Lord, you'd help to meet the needs uh, of our church and our missionaries. And Lord, as we take up this special offering also for uh, supplies for down south, I, I, I do ask that Lord, you'd help us to, to be generous in that aspect. And uh, Lord, that uh, you'd help us to just be a part in, in whatever way you allow us to in those things. And we'll thank you for it. Lord, we love you and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, ushers, if you'll come forward at this time.